any not too much wax. Good there. morning, Eastern Oregon, and welcome to this March 14th version of AM Live on EOA. Your connection to Eastern Oregon, and we're on the EOA network. I didn't know we were that close. Yeah. <laughs> here in a little this bit, we're going to have Union County Commissioner Paul Anders here with us. Today's Pi Day. Pi Day. Yeah, uh, it's the most iconic, irrational number on the earth. Really? Yeah, well, I mean, there you go. It's, I mean, people talk about it all the time. I know, I know. It is like, yeah, that is so. You know when the ultimate Pi Day was? <laughs> on this day in 1592. Okay. At 6.53 a.m., it's the largest correspondence between calendar dates and significant digits of pi. So okay. on 3 14, 1952, at 6.53 a.m., it's the are those, first digits. Are, there, are those nine one nine five three point one four one five nine two six five three five eight? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Odd. 1592 was the day. <laughs> yeah. What about, there's nine people running for uh, commissioner now. <laughs> nine. <laughs> that's got, I, was, I, I, I think that's a record. It's got to be. I know. It's. Uh, it's got to be. It has to be. I, I think it's awesome. I yeah, mean, it just shows I'm, that I'm, people I'm just, are interested. Yeah, yeah, I'm super. I'm super surprised, you know, and but I think it's. I think it's great. It's good for to to know that our you know the county is people yeah. are interested in what happens here. Yeah, what and you and I talked about this. What what is a little bonkers is is that like on the Lagrand City Council. So yeah, nobody. Everybody. All four of those positions are running unopposed. I it's can't. Like, uh, that's, yeah. that's like ludicrous to me. Like two years ago, everybody was worried about And then now all of a sudden you're going to have two city council members that are going to run unopposed to take their seat back and a new person coming in running unopposed. Right. So, yeah. yeah I'd like to see a little more. Well, I think there's three. Interest. Three unopposed. But the commissioner job is a paid job. No, no, no. But right? I'm, I'm talking about... but. I think there are four unopposed city positions. Maybe I've got it wrong. Oh well, if you're counting, if you're counting the mayor, right? Yeah, the the fourth would be Justin. Right. Yeah. So two two council members and the mayor. Every and, two years, three right. seats come open and yeah. the mayor. Yeah. So but, no, and so and I, yeah. So last year there was so much attention, sometimes negative attention about about the city council positions, and yeah. they were all disputed. That's yeah. not quite the right word. They were no, all they contended were all for, contended, yeah, yeah. You know. And and now this year nobody's. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if that's kind of cyclical. Is that the right word? Cyclical. Yeah. I don't know. Like people wait for the four year, or you know. I, I don't know. I think it's. it's but it's, you it's see a long. lot more people running for commissioner because it's a paid job. And, yeah. And city council is not. Well, city council is paid, but it's not. It's minuscule. Not much. Yeah. It's like it's not like a it's minuscule. Not. Yeah. It's like I think it's seventy five bucks a month. So, and yeah. a lot of the counselors, including Justin Rock, one of our sponsors, and 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 also just a super good dude, he donates that money back to a scholarship, or he, yeah. you know, in some a lot of a lot of the city council members do that. But if somebody gets co commissioner, they ain't donating that. That's yeah. a job. That's like a real salary. That's like yeah. Pro I don't know. I don't even know what they make. They probably they got to make like. Fifty, sixty thousand a year. Yeah, probably. I think it's probably. Yeah, it's probably that. Or, I've never looked. I mean, it's and, public knowledge, but right. I don't, I'm not that interested. I'm never going to be a commissioner. I'm not into the politics, so. But it's more. It's it's way more involved than a city council position, or I, even the, or even the mayor. Way more involved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's just it's different. It's completely different. Like yeah. you're you're doing stuff with all different facets of everything in the whole county. We, I mean, we'll we'll hear more about it today. From well, and part Paul. of it, you know, part of it is the, so like in Legrand, uh, Legrand, the a lot of the day to day operations are run by the city manager, and and that's and, why and that, he's paid and he's paid. Yeah, yep. and so and and the county does have a similar position. Shelley Burgess is kind of that position in the county. And she's full time, but it's it's just there's it's just a little different climate. So, hmm. yeah, interesting. 
Yeah. I, I've, I've never been interested in politics. I, I, like, I know, I know how necessary they are, like, especially local. Yeah. But, but like, my, I, I can do more for people by just, you know, like, staying uninvolved. You know what I mean? Like, right. it's not my, it's not my thing. Like, I don't want to talk about <laughs> politics. It's, it's not fun to me. Well, and I, I've, you know, I know way more about it than what I did six months ago. Well, I know way more about it from just sitting here right. listening to right. everybody that comes on here talking about it and, you know, like doing the... Yeah. But it's still just like, I would fall asleep. You would just like, yeah. They, it's a lot of meetings. Yeah. And I hate meetings. You see me, I can't even focus in a one-hour meeting here, let alone <laughs> if I had like meeting. six like, meetings hey, Kyle, a day. Are you here? <laughs> yeah. I'm like checking my <laughs> phone, phone, running to the... In? Getting up, pacing, and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is how, yeah. How it is. But when you have an opinion, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. If there's something that needs to be ironed out, I'm, I, I can focus. But yeah. it's like when we're just, you know, going through the the motions of normal yeah. stuff. I just get like, hmm. yeah. But yeah. yeah. All right. Well, yeah. No, it's it's a it's a wild climate right now. Well, do you want to want to do sports? Let's do it. All right. AM Sports Report brought to you by Northwest Furniture and Mattress. Even though I have a Rockin' Sons hat on today, um, Northwest Furniture and Mattress, man, they have a great selection of American-made uh, furnishings for your home. Awesome mattress selection. I mean, if you go in there, you'll, you'll see. It's, it's awesome. They want to make you comfortable in your own home. LHS softball kicks off their season today at home. Versus Enterprise Joseph Willow, it's a conglomeration uh, team. That game starts at 3 p.m. down at Pioneer Park, and I think it's on Sam Markham. So I think it's on the, the field that's right there by the baseball field, not on the new softball field. LH, LHS baseball won't start their season until next Tuesday. That'll be a home game here versus Mack High at 4 p.m. This Saturday, EOU men's and women's track and field outdoor season starts they're going to split between the pacific northwest invite in corvallis and the electric forest collegiate open in portland so coach welch will send some of the people to corvallis and some to portland based on you know like what they're competing in and where where they are you know as progressively as an athlete EOU women's basketball plays in the first round of the national tournament tomorrow. They are in Great Falls, Montana. That game will start at 4 p.m. Pacific time, and it'll be against the University of Providence. And this is you lose, you're out. So, I mean, they got to win. The opening round is they'll play the first two rounds in Great Falls. And if they win those two games, if they win two games, then they'll go to the final site. So we'll see. I mean, they, they ended up fourth in the conference. They were picked to win it. Um, they're a good team. They're 21 and 7. They've they've had some good wins this year. EOU baseball is at home this weekend versus Bushnell. Games are down at Optimist Saturday, 12 and 3, and then Sunday 11 and 2. And then EOU softball is at home this weekend as well. They will take on a tough UBC team with games on Friday at 2 and 4, and Saturday at 11 and 1. They're at Peggy Anderson Memorial, which is up on EOU's campus. Um, this week I sat down with EOU junior pitcher Kylie Parsons and senior third baseman Gates Leatherwood. Have a look. Um, so growing up in Pendleton, what, what's the thing that you love most about Eastern Oregon? I think just being up in the mountains too and then just the um, community we have. It's I feel like we're very close. Is it weird for you to be you know like you grew up in Pendleton is it weird to be playing softball in LeGrand like a little bit yeah yeah it's got to be right yeah because it's always been every time we played LeGrand it was always so close so competitive always for for years um all right last question I'll get you out of here okay. if if Nicole sat me in front of you and said recruit Dodsey to come play uh softball at EOU what are you going to tell me um like what would it take to come play here basically? no recruit me to oh. come play. Like, t tell me why I should come play softball. At oh, EOU. why you should. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, I think that we, um, playing at EOU, I love this area. Um, I love my teammates. I've built a really strong connection with a lot of my friends here, and I think that's probably the biggest driving force for me 
of what I've loved here so much is my friends that I've made on my team. Um, I think that we have very competitive culture and we're always pushing each other to go, do better and play better. So. And to wrap it up, EOU Women's Lacrosse has a home game this Saturday the 16th at 3 o'clock versus Corbin. So if you're, if you're bored on Saturday, there's plenty of EOU sports, uh, baseball, softball, lacrosse, softball on Friday, baseball on Sunday. It's a big weekend for EOU for here in LaGrande, so go check them out. AM Sports Report brought to you by Northwest Furniture and Mattress. Go check out their showroom, uh, the Daggett family. They, they, the showroom's absolutely beautiful. They want to make you comfortable in your own home. All righty. Cool. Yeah. And let's look outside. Let's look outside. Yeah. It's kind of pretty this morning. It's not bad. No, uh-uh. It's nice and, and clear. And, and, and I, haven't, I haven't looked at the weather forecast since we did it on Tuesday. But it's going to get all the way up into the 60s. Pull that, that graphic up. and yeah. oh, Look at that. 69 on Monday. Ooh. Yeah. So then this, this weekend... <laughs> This weekend with the EOU Outdoor Sports. Be a Perfect. Great, yeah, be a great time. No rain. It's going to be sunny, sunny, yeah. sunny, sunny. Yeah. That's four days of just beautifulness. Yeah, that's crazy. You kind of you kind of wonder if, is this spring? I don't think so. I think we're still going to get. Here, we're going to get snookered yeah, by a snowstorm on here. Yeah, somewhere yeah. along the line. I think so. Yeah. So. I hope not, but I think that that he's got one up his sleeve for us. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, I don't. The the crop. We'll have to talk to Paul about how that affects farming because you have, you know, crop start up, and the danger is is that they could freeze. Yeah, it's or not whatever. good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If it if it if it starts getting nice for like a strip of days in a row and then yeah. it freezes, yeah, yeah, that's not good. Yeah. So. All righty. Well, hey, uh, let me mention uh, Valley Insurance this morning. Uh, appreciate them being one of our uh, sponsors. Um, they are in the old Umqua Bank building in downtown LaGrande. Appreciate their investment in filling buildings that sat empty for a while. And if you haven't had a chance, go in and check out their remodel. Uh, that is also where WorkSource Oregon is, is the other part of their building. But uh, appreciate Matt and Joel and their investment. Uh, in downtown and also in being one of our sponsors. So here in just a minute, we are going to have uh, Union County Commissioner Paul Anders here with us right in just a minute. Eastern Oregon is full of interesting people with interesting minds and interesting things to say. Here at EO Live, we're committed to connecting you to these intriguing people with EO Talks. We let our special guests share their ideas and life experiences with deep, open, engaging, and inquisitive conversations. You'll also be informed in depth on some of the most recent and relevant events, issues, and more. EO Talks on EO Live, your connection to Eastern Oregon, now on Roku. Here in Eastern Oregon, we're blessed to live in such a wonderful area. And though it may seem mild-mannered, there's actually quite a lot that goes on in this area. And apparently, there's two dinguses who happen to be here that are actually crazy enough to get up at the crack of dawn to talk about it. Tune in to AM Live on EOA with Brent and Dodzy, featuring special guests, weather, sports, news, and more, every Tuesday and Thursday at 8 a.m., only on EOA Live, your connection to Eastern Oregon. Now on Roku. Yeah, okay, we're back with uh, County Commissioner Paul Anders, and we were talking about the choice that people have uh, in the county commissioner race that's coming right. up. Yeah, you said nine people? Nine people in it uh, as of the filing deadline on Tuesday. And um, like I was just mentioning to you, what I like about that is that I think that there will be someone that anybody could 
or a person can find someone that they can get behind and, right. and feel comfortable voting for rather than going, oh, I don't like this one, so I'm going to vote for that one right, 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 situation. Right. Yeah. Um, and to that point, uh, the filing deadline, um, I was in Salem on Tuesday, and it's a little bit unique, but they open up the House floor. Anyone can walk onto the House floor. There are rules, no food, no drink. You can't, uh, you're not supposed to touch any of the, the representatives' desks or chairs or anything. But they've got great big tote boards with every House and Senate race plus all the statewide race, which would be Secretary of State, Treasurer, Attorney General. Mm. And it was interesting watching it because they, they just listed them all out by... And you'd go, oh, so-and-so doesn't have any competition this time. And then a little while later, there would be, because it's in real time that they oh, update that. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, I, we didn't stay towards the end because we had to get back home. Uh, but it goes from there to uh, they have kind of a, a kickoff election season uh, events for the two parties. Yeah. And uh, it uh, it was interesting. I'd never been on the, the House floor and. That was a treat, huh? And I, I'm, I had no idea what was involved when I threw my hat in the ring. But this is a thing. I mean, and not only at the county level, but there's a there's a whole ton of state stuff, hoops that have to be jumped through, and boxes that have to be checked, and and if you get it wrong, it can be very serious and lots of fines, and yeah. Right. Right. <clears throat> um, and, you know, I, I've said it many, many times. I, I love my job, but it, there are times where it does slow down. Right. And you're thinking, what should I be doing? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, Tuesday was a, and yesterday were pretty good examples of full days. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday started my day right at 6 o'clock in the morning. Had multiple meetings. Um, and then uh, a relative, I would call it a small group of Eastern Oregon commissioners. There were six of us that, that got to sit down face-to-face -face with the governor and talk to her about some issues that we're having. Uh -huh. And um, also to compliment her on some of the things that she's done. Uh, for me, I think it was huge that she came out to Union County. Actually, all 36 counties because, I mean, east of the Cascade, the, she was clearly not in the majority. Uh -huh. um, so it, but I'm glad she did. She listens well. Um, point in case, I mean, and we had a, a lot of different uh, topics that we talked about. <clears throat> talked about rural mental health and getting um, a better system built around that. Um, fairgrounds funding, um, DEQ and Water Resources Department, and how they're working. ODOT. Um, Oregon Water Resources Department director, one of the commissioners from Klamath Fall wanted to borrow a state dredge. I didn't even know the state owned a dredge. And, <laughs> and commission, yeah. What or, garage do you park that in? Right. Well, yeah. it's it's on the coast, and they want to use it in Klamath Falls, so the, their discussion became, how do we get there? Wow. Um, so, and we talked about the Wallawa Lake Dam, public health modernization, um, and then the one that I talked to her about uh, was that, you know, we just had the resolution about fentanyl in our county. And I think it was really good that we established where we are as a county in that resolution. But like I said in the meeting, if we don't address the problem more aggressively, we're never gonna solve it. Um, and that's why we suggested that the sheriff, the district attorney, and and you mentioned Shelley earlier, Shelley Burgess, who is great at her job, go through the budget. It's a pretty slim budget, but find some money to put towards battling that. Yeah. And so when I was in front of the governor, I talked about in my wallet, I have a list of seven names. All seven of those names are former students that have died of overdose. Wow. Just for, I mean, that's not a very big population pool right. when you think right. about it. Right. Um, and asked for help, and she said she would speak to the appropriate people. And since it's so pr preliminary, I don't want to go into too many details about it. But, and I thought, okay, she listened, she responded. And, but again, there were six of us, and we had about 45 minutes. Right. I mean, her schedule is pretty darn tight. Right. And 
and she just able to click right through it. We, you know, we didn't have a script, but we talked about who was going to talk about which point and right. things like that. Um, interestingly enough, so my, and then my, I ended up going to multiple meetings after that and then got to the house floor and then got home about 8.30. So that was a pretty full day. Right. Um, quarter to nine, my phone dinged and I thought, oh, I'll look at it here in a little while. I looked at it probably five minutes later. Governor Kotek sent me a, a text and said, thank you for sharing about the overdose deaths. It's tragic. I was talking about it with the first lady and I will commit to do what I can to help you solve your problem. Huh. And in those meetings, you never know right. whether you're making an impact or not. I thought, you know, when she said, I'll, I'll visit with the superintendent, um, that was, it was done then, but right. clearly not. I mean, she obviously internalized it, talked about it with her family, and um, I'm hopeful that we can get some help here in, in Union County to help battle that. Yeah, and how, how would, what did that look like? I mean, if you could say, this is what we need, what is it that we need? Well, I'm sorry, and let's, let's back up for just a minute. So explain to us what a resolution is and how it fits in the, the order of trying to get the attention of the state or whomever. Right. Yeah. Um, resolutions come in, can come in basically one form, but a, a variety of different talk, topics. And you, what you do is you list what are facts uh -huh. and then you resolve something. So whereas we've got overdose deaths in our county, whereas fentanyl is rampant, and I'm paraphrasing. Right, right. Uh, be it resolved that we are going to do even more to address the situation. So your what it is is a very public declaration of your intent on what you're going to do about a problem. Or the other way that resolutions are used, it's it's a resolution of support uh -huh. because the. Um, Whichever group is a, a, a contributes to our community, uh, provides for our youth, et cetera, et cetera, uh -huh. be it resolved that we want to recognize them for their good work. Okay. So they can be kind of ceremonial. Actually, they are, in my view, kind of ceremonial, but they can, but they also serve a purpose as kind of putting people on notice that this is a focus. This, this is a thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and above that is you could declare an emergency. We could have, yes. Okay, which... Which a county, at least one county, did go. You, I, I'm, right. from our conversation, you and right. I talked one about One county this did do that. Um, part of the problem, and and again, I want to always rely on the advice, or for steering my decisions, the, the advice of our professionals that work for us. And right. Our emergency manager said, "We can do that. However, it's going to set us up for the next one." Um, that. You can overuse the emergency. Right, right. And, and, it's like and crying so, wolf. Yeah. Right. Couldn't yeah. couldn't the state declare an emergency? We have the highest per capita in the whole country. You know that. Uh, we have the highest Governor uh, Kotek overdose did. fatality. Yeah. Oh, they, Governor okay. Kotek did. And then beyond that, she, um, de she, the mayor of Portland and the chair of Multnomah County's uh, commission, all three of them declared an emergency virtually in downtown Portland. Not all of Portland, not all of Multnomah County, but but that very one center core. Oh, I was just city there. Center. I was just there. Yes. Yeah. City, <laughs> I, part, I was just there. I saw C it. Yeah. The city center thing. is what it is. Task force is what they did. So, and that really led me to get to thinking about how, if possible, she might be able to help us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, in that city center declaration, she directed Oregon State Police to put extra troopers in downtown Portland to supplement Oregon, or excuse me, uh, Portland Police Bureau. Right. And so I get, got to thinking about it, and after the declaration, I think you were there, yeah, we, was, yeah. we invested, like I said, we're, we're talking about adding some money to the drug task force and some for the uh, investigations through different departments. And I thought, I'm going to ask her for a state trooper to be on our drug task force. Mm. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah. And, she, and I said, you did it for Portland. 
I'm not asking for a whole bunch. I'm asking for one to right. be on our drug task force. Right. And uh, that's when she said she would speak to the superintendent, which, and then that yeah. led to other. So then that's the, that's how, that's a way that she can respond to this in a manner right. that will make a difference for us. I believe so, yes. Yeah. Well, and, and as I was telling her, I mean, Measure 110 reforms that just passed the legislature. I think that's a good first step. I don't think it's the final step. Um, and there's been this conversation about really trying to get those that are um, in addiction help, but also getting the supply off the street. Get yeah. the dealers, get, if you will, the, some of the cartels. And, and I am not familiar with it to know who's doing what. But, yeah. Um, and that's why I think it's great that Sheriff Bowen has reinstituted our drug task force. We've had two pretty high profile um, cases, arrests, multiple arrests and cases. And um, with the help of the state police being on that too, which they were at one time, mm -hmm. I think it would help. And, and I've had conversations with Sheriff Bowen and, and uh, Captain Connor of Oregon State Police, very preliminary. But, and one of the things is we're really jumping the system. Normally, they would say Union County, Northeast Oregon's having a problem with drugs, and then it would go through the system, and then the superintendent would direct help. Oregon State Police superintendent would direct help to our county or our region. Right. And in this, we're, like I said, we're hopping to the front of the line because um, the governor can make those you shall. Um, yeah. And she, she's pretty thoughtful about things from the little bit I've been around her. And I think that moving that forward to the front of the line, if you will, it will get the action we need and, and uh, hopefully make a dent in, the, in the, the products that are coming in here that I, I can't imagine anybody being in favor of them being in our, in our county. No. Yeah. Speaking of uh, <laughs> Sheriff Bowen, he says, thank you so much for that. And... I'm pretty sure he's commenting on the fact that you asked for a state trooper on the drug task force. Yeah. yeah. And I will tell you, I, w I was really kind of nervous because, I mean, this is out of my wheelhouse. I, I'm, and I didn't want to get out of bounds and step on, right. on Oregon State Police or, or Sheriff Bowen's turf, but having conversations with them, and they were just very preliminary because I had no idea whether this is going to work or not. Still don't know if it's going to work. But... Um, I, I really felt that I had to do something. And, and if, again, if we can get um, product off the street and we can save one life, that effort to me is worth it. Right. And it's, it's such a, I mean, we all see that, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that and moving through the other process is slow. That is, I mean, that's the way, that's the quagmire that there are so many things that are caught in. Right. Yeah. Um, well, so, and, and state police have, I mean, they've got a lot of responsibilities. I mean, investigations, traffic yeah. control, I mean, any number of things. Um, I mean, we saw it was that last summer or two summers ago when there was a, the, the individuals that were shooting guns and there were state troopers that were coming from all parts of the state right. at a high rate of speed. Um, so there's, their portfolio really does cover a lot of different topics. Well, and a lot of people don't know, and I didn't know this either, that like when it comes to having a crime lab or investigations or whatever, I mean, a county like Union County doesn't have the resources to have that. And so then the state picks up that. So then they're the ones. So it's not just the state troopers that are out there that you see that are patrolling uh, the Oregon highways. Mm -hmm. There is a whole infrastructure that supports law enforcement that a lot of people have no idea. So then if there's some kind of a crime, even at the city level, then they can tap into that. They, yeah, right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I think often that we probably, I should have done something sooner. Um, you know, when I look at that list, it, it's heartbreaking. Um, some of them were, were like, I know I'm not supposed to have favorites in the classroom, but really were. I mean, their personalities were such. Um, and, I, you know, and there's, I have, I know that in this town, I've got 
one in particular that I worry about a lot who is clearly addicted and tried to get him, not me, but many people have surrounded him, tried to get him help, and, and he is really in the throes of addiction. And when I hear about an overdose, I really am concerned that it's going to be him, yeah. uh, which would be, and not that any of them aren't tragic, but that one would, to me, would be, I mean, because of the connection I had with him in the classroom and shop. Right, and it's not, you know, I mean, we think of it addiction, it's not, it's not always in the way that, I mean, in, in my mind, you think of someone who's shooting it into their arm or their, I mean, it's, that's kind of what I think when I think of addiction. But I have a friend who got addicted to painkillers and, and then, you know, because he had surgery and this is not an uncommon path, okay? Yes. No, it's so, the most common. Right, yeah. So it, so it becomes, he, he became addicted to painkillers and so, and then since he couldn't get those pills to take care of the addiction that he had through his surgery, then he bought illegal painkillers right. and they were laced with fentanyl and he died. Yeah, and yeah. that is, so it's not, you know, it's, it's not how, it's not the traditional thing of what we think about someone who is, I mean, it's just mushroomed. It's, it's a much bigger audience it's a much bigger impact than what it has been in the past. For sure. Yeah. No doubt. Well, and, and I don't want to drill too deep on this one, but in, and the governor said, you know, we are in a situation now where young people in particular cannot experiment. Right. Because of the, we've seen it way too many times, one experiment and they're dead, like you said. It's, right. It's not good and, and, uh, and young people tend to want to try different things out, especially if they're, you right. know, maybe a little bit on the shady side, but, uh, yeah. So my hope is that it works. Uh, my thanks is that she's listening and potentially providing us some relief. Well, and kudos to Governor Kotek for doing, I mean, you, you hear politicians will say, yeah, once I'm elected, I'm still representing everyone. Mm -hmm. And, and there are times that we haven't seen that in the past and and uh you know she's she's listening and yes, that, she, yes she is and yeah. she's actively i mean she's yeah. going to the she's doing the work right you know and that is that's that's really good right let me let me back up just a little bit okay. and i i want to i'm i've had a lot of people ask me well well what does a commissioner do and i know you and i have spent some time talking about that mm -hmm. what would you so I, I want you to say what what does a commissioner do what is their job and how much power do you have? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, the power question, um, sometimes surprisingly little, and then other times, uh, you know, like this instance, uh, you have a fair amount of influence. Right. And even influence with the legislature. And I, if I can take a little yeah. side trail to talk about that, I mean, the long, or excuse me, the short session just ended up. Um, I was able, we were able to get a bill that I've been working on for quite some time. And that's uh, county right of way, which is generally speaking the the area be, that the county still owns on the side of the road, right. where utilities generally are placed. Um, we have a permitting process so that we know who's there. And where this really came to light was a few years ago when a farmer called me and said, "Hey, are they putting in new power poles out here?" And I went and looked at what they had, and they had the little wire plastic flags that said "new pole." Right. So. Went back to Public Works, checked, and they were not where they were supposed to be. And so that kind of led to this conversation with Association of Oregon Counties, who was already working on the legislation, um, to get it so that we could recoup some of our costs associated with administering those, those fees. Um, five years. Uh, last summer, Senator Finley and Senator Gorsuch it actually started here during the Economic Summit. Uh, convened a uh, interim work group and, and counties and utilities sat down and, and hammered out an agreement. It got to Salem, got changed a little bit, got changed a little more, a lot of back and forth. And um, I'm kind of happy to say that we have a bill that is headed to the governor's desk at this point. Awesome. So, and, and part of it is I don't think everybody got everything they wanted, which is probably a pretty good way to legislate. 
uh, rather than all for one and none for the other. So, and how does that bill change the scenario that you talked about earlier about the farmer who said, are these polls going in? What it does is it, it allows, in my view, lets our county of uh, public works folks be able to dedicate some time to that rather than issuing a permit, knowing where it is and have it sit in a drawer. Okay. Which is, I mean, that's overstating it, but, but they invest a lot of time and energy into making sure they're in the right place, not cutting someone else's utility, whatever that might right. be, and then putting it back to the way it was rather than just, oh, and then the other one is traffic control. Right. Uh, to make sure that, you know, their workers are safe, the public moving through there is safe, and uh, it's, I think it's going to take a little bit of relief or put a little relief in the, in the equation for our county works budget. It's not going to be huge, but at least we're not having to rob Peter to pay Paul. Right, right. Okay. So then, all right. Well, and so then you're saying that was one of the, you started with that because that's oh, right. one of the ways you were able to influence. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then um, House Bill 4133, which was wildflower, wildfire funding. Okay. <laughs> Easy for me to say. Um was another one, and we I started last fall in Ontario in, a, in an interim work group, uh, or excuse me, not an interim meeting with the interim work group, and uh, Senator Steiner, um, mm -hmm. and she's chair of Ways and Means. As far as the financial side of Oregon legislature, she's got a significant amount of control over uh, the checkbook, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and that moved through, I thought, pretty well. Again, some give and take. Um, and then at the very last moment hit a snag, which was really discouraging because we'd put so much time and energy into it. Uh, one of the funding sources that they were planning on using from the state, it was unconstitutional to use it in that matter, uh. which again, pretty frustrating. And then the, the measure 110, which I measured or mentioned earlier, um, those were, you know, a lot of negotiations on that. Um, I wanna thank, uh, in particular, our sheriff, our district attorney, and their statewide associations. They really had an impact on the legislature communicating to them that the system that we are in is very, very broken. Yeah. So uh, again, I think it's a good first step. I don't believe that it goes far enough. But so, then, so then the influence that you have as a commissioner is you have a pathway to lobby essentially yes. for right. on behalf of right. Union County. And and in our county, and every county is a little bit different, um, it's taking that step. It's being in Salem for the Association of Oregon Counties meetings. Right. Um, and walking out of those meetings and going over to the state house and having a conversation not only with our representative, Levy, mm -hmm. or Senator Hansel, which they always uh, welcome us with open arms and, and are very receptive yeah. to conversations, but taking a walk across the, the, the aisle, if you will, and, and talking to those um, from different areas that have different priorities and beliefs than you do. Yeah. And if, if you don't have those conversations, I can all but guarantee you, you're not gonna get anything through that legislature. Yeah. Uh, so, you know. So it's, it's, so it's kind of like a spotlight. You can shine spotlights on different issues. Yeah, that's a great influence. Way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and then other times, you know, someone will come up to me and say, "What the county needs to do," and I would say, "I fully agree with you, but that is not in our. We can't even control any of that. Right. And it might be, uh, you know, a city of Legrand uh, issue. Right. It might be a state issue. Right. Might be a." Um, Federal issue, right? And you know, if I could make, wave a magic wand, I, there was there's a lot of things I could change, but I I just don't have that. I mean, I can make sure that that message is carried forward, right? Right. And so then those things where the state has restricted Union County in such a manner, you can make sure that that voice is heard on it. You can say, you know, again, kind of like what you did. You have the ability to pass feedback forward. Oh yeah, yeah. and you know, especially during the 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 uh, darkest days of COVID, um, we were having very frequent conversations with the governor's office, Oregon Health Authority, right. um, and 
saying this is not working for us. Right. Um, and there was a, a coalition of, of Eastern Oregon commissioners that really worked hard. If you remember, we got the small rural schools open first. Uh -huh. um, and it was a lot of work. And then I was, the next meeting was like, okay, this is work, seems to be working okay. We're excited to get the kids back into school in front of their teachers. How do we get a school the size of LeGrand in there? Right. And, and I was told very matter-of-factly, Paul, you better be happy with what you got. <laughs> and my answer to that is, I'm not happy with what right. I got. Right. Th there is no reason that if if Cove or Elgin can do it safely, that LeGrand can't do it safely as well. Right. And, uh, and my wife, I think you know, <clears throat> teaches in Union. And after that first spring, when they did go back in the fall under that, that uh, early opening is what I call it, uh, that year she missed three days of school because of someone in her cohort of students getting COVID or being like the whole class being exposed in one, one way or another. Yeah. And she never ended up with COVID during that time. It was significantly later. Yeah. Um, and a little bit of a surprise. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting job. I say it all the time. I love it. I love being a teacher. Um, but, uh, this one's, no two days are the same. And I mean, I, like yesterday, I started at, at uh, 9, which is not especially early, but went 9, 10, 11, 12, 1 2 30, and then 3 for meetings. And Ugh. yeah, I, and one of them, <laughs> I w have, would do that meeting over in a heartbeat. It was so heartwarming to me. There's, uh, and I'm going to let, uh, Sheriff Bowen visit about it because he's really the one that, that brought it to the to the community. But uh, it's going to be life changing for people, young people in our community. And he has mentioned that. He already. has mentioned yeah. that already. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, um, friends of the children. Right. Yep. And I read the book, and the whole time I'm reading the book, you could kind of see what it was leading up to the right. the, the structure of the program. Right. And I'm thinking, there's no way they're going to be able to pull this off. Right. But 12 years of mentorship for people from age 5 to 17 or age 6 to 18-ish. Yeah. Um, and minimum of four hours a week with that child um, and really trying to work on, you know, the way I view it, giving them hope. Yeah. So, yeah, it's awesome. Well, and I was, I was in that meeting yep. too, and, uh, and I'm meeting with Angela later on this morning. And Great. so, yeah, it's super impactful. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it and it not only brings hope to those kids, it brings hope to a community like right, ours. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, and but coming out of the meeting, what I realized, but it's a long, it's a long game. I mean, because because even if it's when it does start here in Lagrand, you're starting with four to six year old kids, and mentoring them for a long time. Right. Yeah. So, so we still have we've still got a lot to do. For the kids that are right. in the wake right now, exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. Uh, Sheriff Bowen says he's so excited for our kids to have a chance with that program. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah he's talked about it on on the last uh, keeping it clear with Cody Bowen. We talked about that uh, oh. quite a bit, actually. Well, cool. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'll never ask you to have a meeting with me. You've got my word on that. <laughs> but what if I ask you? Then I'll, I'll, I'll oblige. But I'll never say, "Hey, Paul, you want to meet?" And ha you know, no, no. I'll just catch you. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm yeah. not. I'm, uh, I couldn't do that. I could not yeah. do. I can't even hardly do one meeting in a day, let alone a week. Six. Yeah. Six. Well, yeah, and I, I think you and I are going to have many more meetings together. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's uh, and I, I've told every one of the candidates um, that I would be more than happy to visit with them. Um, so yeah, I think it's important that folks that are uh, filed know what they're getting into, yeah. and and to that point, know what they can and can't do. One of the ones that I get fairly often is um, there's potholes in my road. And I understand that, but it's not like we're going to do yours because we like you and your, not do yours because we don't like you. But I mean, we actually have a, a system in place for, for how we the prioritize the roads yeah. and it's mostly based on traffic counts. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that 
can be a really difficult conversation at times. Uh, there are some areas that are pretty bad. Yeah, roads. <laughs> like road. especially back behind like uh, the library here. Yeah. Going, going, yeah. going that, west. Yeah, okay. but that's a city thing. Example. <laughs> yeah. Perfect example. Yeah, city That thing. is city of LaGrand. Oh, that is. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, and I'm not right. trying to throw yeah, them yeah, under the right. bus you're because right. I know we've got places in Union County. Oh, no, I will. Visit. Call Kyle. He's the one. No, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but no, but what, what the public doesn't understand, whether it's city or county, is, is that curbs and gutters and roads are tremendously expensive. You know, I mean... The city of LaGrande decided to use their ARPA money. I think it's about $3 million to work on roads. Okay, well, so then I asked Kyle, I said, how, how many, what's the percentage of road that that will restore? Not very much. Less than 50%. Yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so it's just people have no idea how right. and expensive it's, it's, that is. Uh, yeah. yeah, and equipment, um, you know, Dump trucks, if you, uh, you know, and that kind of is a broad category. Yeah. Right? It, we're talking over half a million dollars right. for one. Well, and people, and, and at any city co or county, whatever the level is, ex except when you get to the national government. Anyhow, there's the balance, the budget has to balance. Yes. And so if you're going to spend more money on filling potholes, you're going to spend less money on something else. Right. Yeah. And so, anyhow. Well, thank you. We got it. We got to get you out of here. You have a meeting here in a minute. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate so. being able to come on. <laughs> yeah, take get us. Get Let's us do it on yeah. this day, which is the 14th Pi Day, 1743. The first American town meeting is held in Boston's Finial Hall. 1794. Eli Whitney patents the cotton gin machine, revolutionizing the cotton industry in the Southern United States. Wait just a second. Let, let, uh, he, no, go ahead. If he needs to go, let him go. He's all right. I mean, yeah, there you go. We can do it live. Go. Thanks, man. Just go. Hurry up. There you go. <laughs> 1870, California legislator approves act making Golden Gate Park possible. 1950, the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives, fugitives program begins. 1950. 1967, JFK's body is moved from a temporary grave to a permanent memorial. 2017, the world's oldest golf club, Muirfield in Scotland, votes to admit women as members for the first time in 273 years. And then 2018, NASA twin study finds that Scott Kelly is no longer identical to his twin brother after one year in space. Oh, wow. One year in space, 7% of his genes were altered after one year in space. Really? Yeah. 2019, Google announces its employee, Emma Haruka Iwu, has broken the world record for calculating pi to 31.4 trillion digits on Pi Day, which is today, using the Google Cloud. That's a lot of digits, 31.4 <laughs> trillion. That's a lot. Number one song in America on this day in 1994, Ace of Base, The Sign. Hmm. Quote of the day comes from Walter Baghot. The greatest pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do. One more time. The greatest pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do. All right. Yeah. Good stuff. Yep. Yeah. We're out till Tuesday. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. For, for running being across here. right during my Yeah, being here this morning. Here. Yeah. You know, oh, one more thing before we go. Yeah. You know you know how you, you know how you guys were talking about the the uh governor. Uh-huh. So like for me, mm -hmm. I haven't heard anything about her. And that's a good thing. You know what I mean? Like when yeah, Brown right. was in, all you heard was people all the time. Barrett, Right. I haven't heard any anything. Yeah. I haven't heard anybody. So I mean, it must be she must be doing something better at least. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I have an opinion on that, but so does everybody else. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm just saying I've noticed that I <laughs> no, haven't heard but, people. No, but the one I mean, the one thing I appreciate is is that she's making an effort to get to know us, and and to be aware, and that has not always been the case with the governors that we've had in the past, you know. There have been some of them that, like, they they very seldom have made a trip to Eastern Oregon. Yeah. Yeah, so anyhow. All right. Thanks, Eastern Oregon. We'll see you soon.